Federalist ideas were also absorbed into the policies of this era. Under President James Madison, for instance, the government abandoned Jefferson's idea of relying primarily upon citizen militias to provide military protection for the United States. In the wake of the War of 1812, it was painfully clear that this policy had not worked, and instead the government embraced the idea of a strong navy and a professional army. Some key Hamiltonian economic policies were implemented as well. The charter of the First Bank of the United States had expired in 1811, just prior to the war. However, many people became alarmed when state banks, no longer regulated by a central bank, began to issue a flood of paper currency whose value fluctuated rapidly. In an age where commercial life was growing, the demand for a stable currency was paramount, and in 1816, the Second Bank of the United States was created to try and ensure this. Another Hamiltonian concept that was embraced at this time was the idea of protective tariffs. The war had spurred the development of American manufacturing capacity, but in the aftermath of the war, British producers had begun to dump their products on the American markets, seriously hurting domestic manufacturing interests. In response, the government passed the Tariff of 1816, which significantly raised import taxes, tariffs, to shield domestic manufacturing from overseas competition. The post-war period witnessed an era in which it seemed that political factionalism and fundamental disagreements over government policy were at an end. For a moment in this era of good feelings, it seemed that the American people were more unified than ever, and that they had achieved a broad consensus on where the country should head. Yet, underneath the seeming harmony, conflicts and disagreements still festered, as would shortly become apparent. Two events in 1819 underscored these subterranean tensions. The first was the collapse of the economy in the Panic of 1819. The country experienced a wave of foreclosures, bankruptcies, and bank failures. Many urban workers suddenly found themselves unemployed, and farmers, who had optimistically acquired more and more land during the boom era, found themselves deeply in debt. Some scholars believe this sharp economic downturn was the byproduct of a shift towards a more marked market-oriented economy, which tended to be characterized by a business cycle of expansion and contraction, boom and bust. The crisis sparked a growing economic debate in the United States over how the government should handle the economy. Some blamed the recession on the newly chartered Bank of the United States and demanded its dissolution. Others suggested that it was the heavy schedule of protective tariffs that had been passed in 1816. Conflicts over the proper role of government in regulating the economy emerged once again, full force. The second key event was Missouri's effort to enter the Union as a slave state. Up until this time, the states had been equally balanced between slave and free. The entry of Missouri would tip the balance of power in the Senate towards the slave states. Many Northerners were also concerned that the institution of slavery was spreading northward into the Louisiana Purchase, and that if left unchecked, it would dominate this territory and prevent the spread of a free labor economy. For almost a year, Congress deadlocked over this issue until Henry, Cl Henry Clay crafted what became known as the Missouri Compromise. Under this agreement, Missouri was allowed to enter as a slave state, but it was balanced by the entry of Maine as a free state. It was also stipulated that no further territory north of the Mason-Dixon line in the Louisiana Territory would be open to slavery. It was reserved to settlement under the free labor system. This compromise settled the immediate issue, but it didn't resolve the underlying conflict between proponents of slavery and free labor. Thomas Jefferson prophetically noted that this would be an issue that would tear the United States apart. Quote, this momentous question, he said, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at once as a knell of the Union. It is hushed indeed for the moment, but this is a reprieve only, not a final sentence. A geographical line coinciding with a marked principle, moral and political, once conceived and held up to the angry passions of men, will never be obliterated, and every new irritation will mark it deeper and deeper." Unquote. It was in the context of these renewed debates over the proper nature of government and the growing divergence between northern and southern society that a new system of rival political parties would ultimately emerge.